go. So turn with me, as I said, Matthew chapter uh, 1, and we're going to be looking at verse 23, and then we'll also be looking uh, this morning in the Gospel of Luke. But I'll begin with verse 21. And she will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. And all this took place, that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall give, be with child, and shall bear a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which translated means, God is with us. And Joseph arose from his sleep, and did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took her as his wife. And he kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, for the opportunity, Lord, that we have to come into your house to worship. We pray, Lord, as this is the beginning of the Christmas season, the Advent season, that, Lord, we might remember the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and that we might look forward, Lord, to his second coming as well. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would be glorified as we would look to your word now, that you might use it to encourage us, to strengthen us in our faith. For we pray in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Uh, I've told you before I love a good mystery. I love uh, British mystery TV and a lot of the books that most of those are based out of. Uh, over the years, we've enjoyed the detective shows, including Morse and uh, Poirot, Poirot, right? <laughs> And uh, Lewis and Maygray and Hetty Wainthrop and Inspector Lindley and Shetland and, and Foyle's War. And I don't know, you can just go on. You would think that England would have the highest murder rate in the world by the number of detective shows that they have. But um, nonetheless, there is something challenging about trying to figure out an event when you are only getting bits and pieces of information at a time. And that's what a mystery is really about, isn't it? You get bits and pieces of information. Sometimes that fits, sometimes it doesn't fit. Sometimes you think it fits and it really doesn't fit. Sometimes you don't think it fits and it does fit. And all of it gets wrapped up nice and neatly in the end and it gets explained to you by a little Belgian, right? Or by some other person. Well, a mystery. A mystery is something the Apostle Paul speaks about. Of the mystery hidden for many ages but now made manifest. That's Romans chapter 16. A mystery means something very specific in this context. Theologically speaking, it's not exactly about a thrilling novel or a surprise ending or even a murder. But it's actually kind of close to that. A mystery is about a plan that God is working through the course of everyday human events. People falling in love, people getting married, kids being born, growing up themselves having kids, one nation warring against another nation. All these things you can see. But there's a hidden purpose of God that is being accomplished underneath it all and ultimately through it all. These, oftentimes, we can't totally see. Most importantly, you can't quite see where it's all going. But the focus of the season of Advent, or Christmas season, is to contemplate the unfolding of that mystery and to marvel on how all of the threads of salvation's history come together in a single person born in Bethlehem, the Lord Jesus Christ. The plan of God working through generations, working through centuries, comes down to one person in one stable, in one little insignificant town. And today we're going to examine three overriding purposes of Advent, kind of as an introduction to Advent and to the Advent season, to kind of put it in its proper perspective. By and large, uh, Advent is, uh, is a term that's only been used in the evangelical church, by and large, about the last 20 or so years. It's been a staple of the mainline church, but the evangelical and fundamental church has kind of tried to ignore it over the years because we didn't want to seem too Catholic, right? And yet we missed out on one of the most important seasons of the year. And if it wasn't to disassociate ourselves with Catholics, it was to disassociate ourselves with the mainline churches, whatever, and we've kind of, we, we missed all the joy, all the splendor that is this time of year. That is the importance of thinking about our Lord and Savior's coming. And also thinking with that, we consider his second coming and look forward to that as well. Uh, during the Middle Ages of the church, it was a time of special prayer and fasting. It wasn't necessarily associated with a lot of eating and feasting that we do today, and certainly not with gift giving like we do today. 
But that's all developed and that's all changed kind of over time. The important part is to remember what happened at Advent. What happened with the coming of Christ? And as I said, we're going to examine three overriding purposes of what actually, what the meaning was for this time of year, this Advent, this coming of Christ. The first purpose that we see is found here in Matthew chapter 1. Look at verse 23. The first purpose of Advent is the incarnation. The word incarnation is a heavy theological term, and it's the Advent, the coming, this time of year, is all about the incarnation. And what do we mean by that? It's not a word that you're going to actually find in the Bible, but it's a Latin word that means enfleshment, that Christ, that God came in the flesh, the doctrine of the Son of God becoming human. Jesus did not just play at becoming a man, but he took on the flesh with all of its problems, with all of its weaknesses, the incarnation in the Christian understanding means that Christ is both God and man. And listen, that makes all the difference. The core of the Christian faith is really a pessimism about man and life and an optimism about God. You know, when we look around, we recognize that man's sinful. We recognize that the world is, uh, is in a bad way. But we also recognize that there's hope in Jesus Christ. There's hope for salvation. There's hope for eternity. There's hope because God has sent forth his son, so there's always hope. Even in his sin, man is under the sign of redemption because God has identified himself with man's guilt and sin in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. He didn't separate himself from us. He came to us to redeem us. In Christ, God has taken upon himself the, the shame and the guilt of the world so that those who turn to him might be set free, might have eternal life. Evangelical Christianity looks beyond man as sinners to Christ as a redeemer. Your future is available to you in Christ. You don't have to be locked in your past. You don't have to be a victim of your past. You don't have to be a victim of your past sin and the guilt that's associated with that, you can go to Christ. The incarnation uh, fulfills the earliest of prophecies. Every human life has its link with the past by simple acts of heredity, right? Yet the anticipation of the individual's arrival is confirmed to the, the few months prior to his or her birth. Right now we're looking forward to in just a couple of weeks, Lord willing, we'll have another grandchild. Yeah, but that's been going on for months, and if you back up the history, it's been going on for years and generations and generations. In this case, the case of Christ, the whole gamut of redemption history was pregnant with the promise of his coming. If you go back to the first book in the Bible, the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That is the first what's called evangelical problem, uh, pro promise in Scripture. Maybe it's the problem, too, I guess. Which wonderfully introduces that Christ will be coming to set us free from sin's curse. Here we are in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, and we begin to see the full importance of what is meant by Emmanuel. Pastor Richard talked about that. Zach spoke about that. Emmanuel, that God has come to us. And that passage that was given, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it goes back 700 years prior to Matthew chapter 1. 700 years, three times uh, as long as our country has even been in existence, this promise had stood in place that Israel had looked forward to, had hoped for, had put its trust in, that Messiah, that Emmanuel was coming to be the spiritual, moral redeemer of the world. Think of that expectation, how long, through all of the conquest, through all of the famine, through all the war, through all that had taken place in Israel's history, and they were looking for still his coming 700 years later. What's the importance of the incarnation for you and me? In other words, does it have any effect on me today? Does this have any importance for me today or or is it just about a Christmas tree? Is it just about presents? Is it just about food and fun times with family? The Bible insists on not only the deity of Christ, but also the uniqueness of Christ. He's not just God, but he's God in human flesh. 
And this event happened at one point in time and place in history. So you see, no matter what our culture attempts to do, in an attempt to include everyone in the season's greetings, or to water down the uniqueness of the message, God entered into humanity. At some point in time, at some place in, in, in a locale, God entered human history, and everything is different because of that. You see, even in the incarnation, we see the purpose of Christ in his coming. In Luke chapter 1, verse 33, the scripture tells us, And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and for his kingdom there will be no end. How long has the house of Windsor been around? How long were the Tudors around? How long were, you just go down the Yorks around, how long were they around? Well, years, some maybe centuries. No one had an eternal kingdom except our Lord and Savior. What's the function of his incarnation? What did it perform? Well, it brought godliness. It brought God in a human body. It brought God so that we could see, even though it was disguised in human flesh, we saw what God was like and who God was. And so that's exactly what we see in Christ. Jesus is more than a prophet. He's more than a holy man. He is the sin bearer. He is the mediator between God and man. He was not only a model or an example, as some might try to say, but he was the savior of the fallen humanity. As St. Ambrose put it, having become the sin of all men, he washed away the sin of the human race. Do you know Christ? Do you know Christ as your savior? Have you, have you looked to see that the incarnation holds a special message for you? It holds your salvation. Turn to Christ, look to Christ. In the Advent season, and in Advent itself, the coming of God, we see that the Son of God became the Son of Man, taking on human flesh. In the Old Testament, God was accessible only through the mediation of priests and prophets, through tabernacles and temples. No Israelite could properly see God. Yet six times in the opening of his first letter, the Apostle John says, we saw him. We saw him. We saw him. We saw him. Seeing Jesus' earthly ministry, the majestic God of heaven and earth, cries out to the crowds, come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. The incarnation brings God to man at man's level. In man's condition, so that man might find salvation. The second purpose of the Advent is illumination. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1, just over probably a few pages in your Bible. In Luke chapter 1, verses 78, 79, uh, because of the tender mercies of God, with which the sunrise from on high shall visit us, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And then also in chapter 2, verse 32, which says, A light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of thy people, Israel. Illumination. The purpose of light, right, is to illumine, to make that which is hidden in darkness light and exposed. I have to have, make a confession. If you've got those blue-white lights on your car, I don't like you. <laughs> right? I am so sick of those things when you're driving along, especially you're out in the country roads in Iowa and you're driving along and it's nice and dark out and I've got my old dim yellow lights going down the highway and then somebody comes over a hill, usually in a pickup truck, with those excruciating bright blue lights. And the only thing you can do is look away, right? You can't because it's so bright. Maybe you don't have that problem, I do. I don't like it. But you know what? That's the purpose of light, isn't it? Purpose of light. Shine in the darkness to expose that which has been hidden to this point in time. Uh, and so we think about light in relation to Christmas. We, we think about the lights that we put up in our home, with lights we put on our Christmas tree. How many of you will go or have gone to Coraville to look at the luminaries on, on one of the nights of Advent where they line up the entire, pretty much the entire town 
uh, with luminaries all up and down the street. Uh, why light? Why is light so much a part of this time of year, not 4th of July or, you know, Easter? Because light came into the darkness. Every time you see, as you go down the Coralville Strip, or you go through different parts of Iowa City where they might have lights up, as you go through and you see the lights, even if it doesn't point to Christ, it points to Christ. Even if they're not overtly religious in their, their themes, it points to Christ. Why? Because it points to the fact that at this time of year, we put out all these lights. Why? Because light entered into darkness. Light entered into darkness. In Christ, the light of God came to the darkness of earth. What do we think of at Christmas if it's not the pretty lights? Why do we have the lights displayed and the trees lit up in our homes and put stars on the sides of our, our, our homes or garages? Why? Because to shine upon them that sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Zacharias actually said that. It was a prophecy of what would come. Bertrand Russell, the, the noted English atheistic philosopher, once was asked, if you meet God after you die, what will you say to him to justify your unbelief? And he said in reply, in his kind of sappy English voice, I will tell him that he did not give me enough evidence. Really. God entered into history. The light of the world came from heaven. And, 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 you know, the whole purpose of Christ's advent is to bring light to what was in darkness. Russell's argument, and you've probably heard it before from other people, it's a straw, it's a straw man argument. It, it's, it's, it's impossible to not notice a beam of light when you're in darkness, right? It's impossible. And, and truthfully... His argument was one of denial. The light was not solely for the benefit of the Jews, but the scripture tells us for all people. In Luke chapter 2, verse 32, we see the prayer of Simeon, an elderly man to whom it had been revealed that he would live to see the consolation of Israel, the Messiah, come. Joseph and Mary have taken the infant. This is obviously later in the Christmas story. Uh, Jesus on the eighth day in order to bring him into the temple. And there this elderly man says to him, verses 31 through 32, and you see this is a very popular concept in the book of Isaiah. Simeon spent time meditating on the consolation of Israel, the light that has come into this world. So let me ask you, what are you doing to share the light? The light of Christ. What are you doing at this time of year to share the light of Christ? This is one of two times of the year in which most people, even in a godless City like Iowa City, well, I guess it's not godless, it's just not the same as our God, right? A pagan city like Iowa City will be, generally speaking, open to the gospel at this time of year. What are you doing? What am I doing to share the word, to share the light of Christ? If you guys remember years ago, there was a TV show called Extreme Home Makeover. Remember that? It was a... Uh, Ty Pennington, who I described as a squirrel on uppers. Um, <laughs> he, he was Mr. Energy, and the basic theme of the story is you'd find somebody that was a hard luck case, and, you know, life had kind of done them wrong and dirty, and they came in, and they had a budget, and they fixed up their home, and, or else made a, you know, some gigantic home for them, did a redo on their home. I think they'd give them money as well. With that, and if you remember, they actually came to Iowa and did that. There was a very, there was a family that had a very much a hard luck case, and um, they came and they did an amazing job, spectacular job of remodeling their home, and it just changed their lives, and it helped them out of this this uh, terrible situation that they had found themselves. Now, what would you think if uh, if you were in that situation? If you were in that hard luck case and they couldn't get a hold of you. Uh, and so they, they thought, well, you know, we know that they're good Christians. And, and so we're going to go find their pastor 
pastors, and we're going to get the message to them and tell them that uh, Ty Pennington wants to come to your house and do a complete makeover. He's got a million-dollar budget. He's going to change your life, change your home, probably change your property taxes, but we won't go into that. Uh, and, and all of this is going to happen, and they come to the office, and Amy's busy doing something or another, and Richard's busy doing something or another, and I'm asleep, you know. Uh, um, and they come in, and they, they ask if, you know, do you know where... Congregant X lives. Do you know Congregant? Oh, yeah, I do. I, I, I'll, I'll, take, I'll get the message to him. And then, you know, the next phone call comes in. The next person comes in off the street. And the next thing comes in. And, and the person's in the hospital, somebody. And, and we get distracted and we go on. And, of course, we've got all these kids anyways and everything else that's going on in life. And a week or two later, we remember, oh, my goodness, I seem to have forgotten something. And I didn't tell you about it, or Rich didn't tell you, or Amy didn't tell you about it. What would you think? You dirt balls. That's what you'd think, right? How could you possibly have forgotten to tell me? Ty Pennington could have changed my life. My home could have been changed forever. Well, that's what we need to think about this time of year. If we sit on the good news... If we sit, if we hide the light, if we put it under the peck measure or the bushel, as the scripture says, instead of putting it out there so that other people can see it, what does this do for others? It hides the truth of what Christ has done for them. How is this illumination applied to me? Christ's illumination allowed for the Holy Spirit to illumine the believer. Specifically, the doctrine of illumination tends to relate to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which helps the believer to understand the truth of scripture. The gospel of Jesus Christ brings an enlightening through the experience of salvation as the Holy Spirit enters into the non-believer. When that happens, your life is changed immeasurably and forever. Because now you can see the things of Christ. Now you can see the things of God the Father. Now you can see what God has written in his scripture and you can understand better what it is that he has said. So many people I know, they look at the Bible and they say, I don't understand the Bible. Well, yeah, that's because you don't know the author of the Bible. That's because you don't have the mindset of the author of the Bible. You don't understand the purposes. But when you come to Christ and the Holy Spirit indwells us, he begins to show us the word and we begin to understand it. I'd say it's almost magical, but that'd be blasphemous. It's supernatural. It's supernatural what begins to happen. I'll never forget, I had a wonderful professor, an uh, undergraduate, uh, and he was a religion professor. It was a secular university. I didn't go to a Christian college. And, uh, and I thought he was an amazing professor. He had an earned PhD from the University of Chicago, and uh, it was a Bible as history class, and so we were always in the scripture. And he was a genuinely nice man, genuinely kind man. Uh, you know, he was open for intellectual uh, debate, much more than what you tend to experience nowadays. Uh, he was tolerant, and, you know, he, he knew that I was an uh, evangelical Christian. Uh, and, and I sat there and I wondered for such a long time, why doesn't this guy get it? Why doesn't he understand? Why can't he see the plain, you know, of what it is? Because to him, all it was was an academic experience. For me, it was my life. It was my life. It what changed my life. It was all that I was about. It was what I knew. It was what was changing me. And it's what can change you. It's what can change your neighbor. It's what can change your family member. If you just expose them to the light. The Spirit's illumination reminds me uh, that we have to tie into him, to Christ. That we have to appropriate what he wants to do in us as believers. Don't be frugal with the things of God. Don't be frugal in what God wants to do. God has unlimited resources. Amen. And he wants to use those in an unlimited fashion in your and my life. Max Lucado has a book in which he tells a story about an old, frugal, uh, uh, widowed woman uh, on the western coast of Ireland in the first half of the 20th century. 
She was wealthy, and she was frugal, and she was the first home uh, that had electricity brought uh, to the home. And the people were surprised because they didn't think, you know, that she would spend the money on that. Several weeks after installation, the first meter reader came around and appeared at the, the door, and he asked if the electricity was working. And he assumed that there was a problem. And she said, well, no, it, it's, it's working fine. Why do you ask? And he said, well, your meter shows scarcely any usage. Uh, we're wondering if there's been outages. We're wondering if the line is still connected. Uh, are you using your power? Why, certainly, she said, I am. Each evening when the sun sets, I turn on my lights just long enough so I can light my candles, and then I turn off my lights again. <laughs> she tapped into the power, but didn't use it. She had it hooked up to her house. Uh, she was connected, but she, her life wasn't altered by it. You know, I think that's the way it is with a lot of us. We're connected to Christ. We're connected to the people of God. We're part of the church, part of the church family. We go to the meetings. We sing the songs. Uh, we do those types of things. But I'm not allowing Christ to change my life. Not allowing Christ to change my affections. Not allowing Christ to deal with my sins. I'm connected, but I'm unaltered. Are you allowing Christ to change your life? Your heart can be changed. Your life can be changed. Your addictions can be overcome in Christ. Are you the one that's resisting transformation? All you have to do, it's like when people ask, you know, how do you defend a lion? You let him out of the cage. He does a great job defending himself. How's the Holy Spirit work in our lives? Just let him loose. He'll change the things in your life. You say, well, you don't know the problem I've got. No, but I know the Savior you've got. And I know he's bigger than any problem that you've got. And I know the Holy Spirit who indwells you can change your life. And I know that the scripture says that he who began a good work in you will what? Carry it on until what? The day of Christ or completion or however your version says it, right. All too many people have their souls saved and their hearts unchanged. Souls are saved, they've prayed the prayer, they've trusted Christ, but they're not trusting the Holy Spirit's work in their lives to change and alter them completely. Don't resist the transformation. Let me ask you, are you living your life under the illumination of the Holy Spirit? Are you living in a way whereby you are actively seeking the Lord and his leading through his word and his spirit in order to better know his mind? Or are you simply acting like that old Irish woman? Yeah, you're kind of hooked up to the source, but you're really not using the power. Christ brought the light of God into the world that was dark, still in darkness and sin. Maybe you're living in darkness today. Maybe you're living in sin today. Maybe you are here today, and you don't know anything about Christ and what he's done for you. Friend. Seek out this person named Jesus. Turn to him. Put your faith, your trust in him. Third and finally, the, the third purpose of Advent is this purpose of salvation. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, the scripture says, And she will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. And over in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, Similarly, for today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The final purpose of Christ's advent that we're going to examine today is the purpose of salvation. Salvation. Jesus Christ came to bring salvation to you and to me. Verse 21. It could be a sermon in this one verse. Three main items announced in this one verse by the angel speaking to Joseph prophecy. You will have a son. This was before the days of ultrasounds, right? Yeah. There was no virtual imaging back then. You will have a son. Prophecy. Pledge. You will name him Jesus. Jesus, a special name. Purpose. Three. He will save his people from their sins. 
In a lot of Asian cultures, they have this interesting practice on the child's first birthday, especially in Korean culture, where the child will, they'll have the entire family and friends that will gather for the child and for uh, his or her birthday, and they'll lay out certain things, like a ball, uh, like money, uh, maybe a stethoscope, uh, you know, something else like that, which has a representation of a, a career, okay, maybe a book or something along those lines. And then they let the child crawl, and whatever that child touches, they, they say, well, that's what that child is going to do in life. So going to be a financier, going to be an athlete, going to be a scholar, going to be a doctor, going to be whatever it is, you know. That's the mindset. And, of course, part of that's tongue-in-cheek and the understanding, but there's the idea that this will be his or her purpose. Well, guess what? The scripture didn't wait until Jesus was one. The scripture announced his purpose before he even came to earth. What would be his job? What would be his, his duty? His duty would to be to save his people from their sin. You think about the way in which this world was prepared for the coming of Christ. Christ was born at a time in which the Greek world had influenced the culture with its dominance in language. The Roman world had contributed the elements of communication and stability and, and law in order the Jer Jewish world had uh, proved its rich history of, uh, of a religious background. And into that, into that perfect timing, Christ came. Christ came. Friend, this salvation that we speak about, it is good news. Sounds like a great name for a church, right? It's good news. A.B. Simpson, who was one of the founders of the Christian Missionary Alliance, he is reported to have said that the gospel tells rebellious people that God is reconciled, that justice is satisfied, that sin has been atoned for, that the judgment of the guilty has been revoked, the condemnation of the sinner canceled, the curse of the law blotted out, the gates of hell closed, the portals of heaven opened wide, the power of sin subdued, the guilty conscience healed, the brokenhearted comforted, the sorrow and the misery of the fall completely and totally undone. Amen? Amen? Now, I'm just going to tell you, if Tony Evans would have said that on the radio, they would have applauded. <laughs> it's the truth. It's the good news. I didn't say it. A.B. Simpson said it. I just recorded it, right? Think of that. What Christ has done. The title of Emmanuel. God is with us. God is with us. He has come to vanquish the mortal enemy that has always been against the souls of men, our sin. Vanquish death itself. The final battle, the ultimate victory has been won. But just for the record, let me make it abundantly clear. Salvation or conversion entails turning to Christ in faith and turning from sin, which is called repentance. Repentance. You need to renounce your sin. You can turn by faith to Christ, but you also need to turn from your sin. From your sinful lifestyle. From your commitment to sin. From that as being the norm for your life. You need to turn from that to Christ. And remember what I said just a few moments ago. The Holy Spirit will give you the power to live victoriously. Regeneration does not imply an alteration of your old nature. It is the imputation of an entirely new nature within you. God has given you a plan of salvation. He has sent his son to die for you. Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, entered second person of the Trinity. The son of God died so that you wouldn't have to, so that I wouldn't have to. God's plan of salvation required a response from you and me. How do we respond? The unborn plans of God are also protected by faith, redemptive faith. And in other words, when we trust God, we arrive at his promises. We see that in Joseph in the story here. His faith, his willingness to believe God. Joseph intended to serve a, a certificate of, uh, of divorce to end the engagement that he had to marry to handle the matter quietly, to deal with it in his own way. But now the Lord speaks to Joseph, reveals to him his plan, 
And by faith, Joseph is willing to believe it. His eyes are open to the things of God. He glimpses God's divine plan, and life is different from then on. Don't feel like you have to control everything. It's a life of faith. Don't feel like you have to be able to control all of what's going on around you. It's okay. God's in control. God's in charge. He's okay. We have to remember all this world around us is trying to cause us to lose focus of what's truly going on and what has gone on. In John Krakauer's book, Into Thin Air, he relates the hazards that plagued mountain climbers in their expedition in Mount Everest in the spring of 1996. Great loss of life ensued on one expedition. Some factors were out of their control, but fundamental mistakes cost the group dearly. One who lost his life was Andy Harris, who was one of the expedition's leaders. On his descent, he became in dire need of oxygen, and he radioed the predicament to his base camp, telling them of the need and that they had come across a cache of oxygen canisters that were left by the other climbers. Those who had already passed knew that those canisters were not empty, but they were in fact full, even though Harris thought they were empty. Even as they pleaded with him on the radio to make use of them, it was to no avail. You see, he was already starved of oxygen. And what happens when that's the case? Confusion sets in, right? He began to argue. Harris's problem was the lack of what he needed, had so disoriented his mind that though he was surrounded by the restoring supply, he continued to complain of its absence. So many people today, in our Western world in which we think science is all the answers and everything else, we, we see that our lives are out of control. We see that we're addicted to all sorts of things in our, in our lives. Uh, we see that our relationships are broken and falling apart around us, and yet we don't look to the source that can redeem us and save us. Why did Christ come? To save his people. The incarnation, it's a deep mystery. For we cannot fully understand how God could take on our humanity without giving up his deity. But we take it by faith. We can, however, understand that the incarnation reveals God's infinite love and grace for you and me. He didn't leave us alone in our sin, but he entered into the misery of this fallen world without becoming a sinner in order to rescue us from eternal damnation. Have you ever been in some strange place, some unfamiliar place? Have you ever been there by yourself, and you're lost, and you don't know where you're going? Yeah? Is that an unnerving, how, for, for how many of you is that an unnerving experience when that happens? Yeah, right? Uh-huh. Now, what about you're in that same place, but you got your best friend with you? What is that? experience just become? It's an adventure. Absolutely. What was at one point terrifying, right, is now an adventure. I want you to think about that with life. This life can be pretty terrifying if you're doing it on your own, can't it? If the Savior's walking right beside you, it's an adventure. He came to redeem us, he came to live with us. He came to take us to eternity with him one day. And you know what? We'll never tire of that adventure. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for what you did in entering, entering our sinful and fallen world to redeem it, to restore it, to cause us to be able to have a relationship with you once again. We thank you, Lord, for your unfailing love. And Lord, at this time of year, we pray that we might remember that and consider that all the more. For we thank you in Jesus, our Savior's name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. This time, Pastor Richard, if you'll come.